to tell people don't read the comments. Um, I would actually go one step further and think maybe it's come time that we actually rethink comments on the internet altogether, particularly rethink comments on student blogs altogether. Do, should we expect students to have to host comments on their blog, to moderate comments on their blog, right, to respond to comments on their blog? If we give students the opportunity to own their own domain, which is, I think, one of the most important things that is happening in education technology right now, to have their own space on the web, I don't know if we should require them to let anyone else into that space, right? Anyone that can create a user account gets to come into your domain. I don't know. I think it's perfectly acceptable to say to someone who wants to leave a comment on your blog post to like, go respond on your own blog, right? I don't think you're under any obligation to hold someone else's, to host someone else's thoughts in your own domain. And I think that that sort of starts to get at some of the things I think are sort of s moving towards us addressing this unpleasantness. It's sort of by design, we've ended up with these technologies that look a certain way, right? And I think that we can think about how to build something different. And I think we have to think about what that looks like socially, right? How to be nicer human beings, perhaps. But also, what does that look like? technically. Um, you know, as I said, like, the current shape of education technologies and social technologies are sort of shaped by these ideologies, by certain engineers, right? And we don't have to, we don't have to, be, we don't have to accept that. It doesn't have to look that way. We don't have to do tech a certain way because that's how it's always been done. We can design differently, right? We can design around things we can use technology differently. We can sort of use around these systems. I think one of the interesting examples of this that sort of combines a dual approach that's both technological and um, social, it's outside the realm of ed tech, um, is BlockBot, which is a Twitter application. And sort of having grown weary of the constant stream of abuse online, a group of, um, and, and Twitter sort of refusal to deal with it. Um, a group of feminist developers wrote this tool called BlockBot. It's an application that when you installs it, lets you block en masse a large list, a sizable list of Twitter accounts who are known for being serial harassers. The list of blocked accounts is updated collaboratively, right? It's a community effort. And there's also a tool that lets you, a similar tool that lets you block a series of IP addresses that are known from coming from places that are also serial harassers. So you don't have to have someone even be able to like, access your site. This gets a sort of a little bit of you know what I'm what I'm thinking about here in order to make education technology be sort of habitable, right? Sustainable. It's not, like, the internet as it is currently is not habitable, and it is not sustainable for me. It is not healthy. I think we have to rethink the technology, right? It's not really either, like, this nostalgia for a web we lost. I think it has to be a move forward for a web we've yet to see, right? I think it has to be inclusive, and it has to be equitable, and I think that you know, education technology probably needs to be reminded of this as well. That we don't actually have to s adopt tools in education technology that serve business goals or that serve administrative goals, particularly when they are the detriment to scholarship and to students. Um, I don't think we have to adopt technologies that are going to surveil students and control students and restrict access to things under the guise of safety. That's going to be the f administrator's first Goal, right? Well, we'll just protect stu students, right? We'll just protect, we'll just protect students from things. That's really not meeting students' needs at all. It's not recognizing that students have agency. Um, I don't think we, we think we have to recognize that technology doesn't actually have to extract value from us. We don't have to accept technology that puts us at risk, right? We don't have to accept that the architecture, the infrastructure of these tools make it easy for harassment to occur without any consequences. 
we can build different tools. We can build better technology, right? We can build them with and for our communities, for communities of scholars, for example, for communities of learners. We don't have to be paternalistic. We don't have to protect students from the internet as though we're gonna like trot out all of the stranger danger warnings um, once again from the 90s, right? That the internet is full of predators and pedophiles. That's not quite what I mean, but I think we have to recognize if we want education to be online, if we want sort of our civic and public lives to be online, if we want education to be sort of immersed in technology and technological and in information and networks, we cannot just throw students out there, right? We have to be braver. I think we have to be much more compassionate, and I think we have to build that into education technology. Um, like the BlockBot, this is, has to be something that's a collaborative effort that reflects the values that matter to us, right? That the, the technology we build should reflect our values. Because I think that's the thing, right? The answer to this, to answer to harassment online, the male domination of the tech industry, it actually has to be us doing something. The answer isn't silence. That is, I think, what Rebecca Solnit reminds us, one of the goals of mansplaining, to get us to cower, to get us to hesitate, to get us to doubt ourselves, to doubt our stories, to doubt our needs, to step back and to shut up. So I repeat, like, the answer is not to be silent. So one more story, and this is actually, I think, the most important cautionary tale of recent months. Um, the most important cautionary tale about gender and equity and silence. And it's not actually from Gamergate, and it's not from Shirtgate. Um, but it's the revelations that came last month, and I'm not sure it's a story you'll be familiar with, about uh, Canadian radio celebrity John Gomeshi. Right? He was the host of a very popular radio show. Um, he was suddenly fired by the CBC and allegations quickly emerged about violent sexual assault. Gomeshi, for his part, said that this involved spurned ex-lovers. It's always spurned ex-lovers, right? A lot of them teaming up together to destroy him. Um, he said he was being punished for what, in his words, were consensual BDSM. The women, and there are now over eight accusers, say otherwise. They say it was not consensual. They say it was assault. But it isn't just these women, these eight women, who've come forward about John Gomeshi. A huge number of members of the Canadian media and of the Vancouver music scene have spoken out too, and they confessed that they knew. They knew. There was talk, right? There was chatter. There were warnings whispered. One woman wrote a piece in which she explained carefully what, when people asked do you know about John? The question didn't apply, do you know John Gomeshi, the popular radio host of the show Q? It meant, do you know? Do you know? Just be careful. He's weird with women, a male friend had warned her when she first joined the scene. And she wrote, I was warned by this. I kept my distance. I just watched and I saw the way he moved towards women, introduced himself, pushed his way into their space. Nothing you'd call a crime, not quite. I think you could name just a sense, all the little things that added up to say, this isn't safe, this person isn't safe. Boundary issues, we call them, right? They were persistent. I saw it on other occasions, though only a few other parties, where I might lean my head against another woman, woman's so that we could exchange our warnings in the night. Through these other women, I started to hear stories filtering through in little bites. It felt as though everyone had a friend with a story, a friend who'd been hurt or leered at, a friend who'd been uncomfortable or cornered or afraid. But how could you say that? How could you say that in a way that you would ever be believed? How could you describe that for a world in the way that the world would ever believe? So instead, you just turn to the women around you and you say, do you know about John? And you watch them nod and they pass it on. And that's how networks work, right? We exchange important information with one another. We try to build community. We try to build, keep our community safe. But I think that this anecdote 
around that sort of highlights the way in which power in these networks work as well, about what access to certain networks afford us. Networks can afford us protection, but if you aren't part of the right network, right, perhaps you didn't get the whispered warnings, right? Perhaps you were part of an adjacent network, right? A network of powerful people who knew about John, but chose not to say anything or not to do anything. It's not a perfect analogy to EdTech by any means, but I want to draw the comparison here because I feel like the stakes are really high, right? We have to think about what networks we're building, right? What networks we're using, how do they reflect information? But how do they reflect power? Who do they put, who do they protect? Who do our networks protect? And who do our networks put at risk? Because we can't actually sit back and let the harassment and abuse go on, because we know it goes on. We can't ignore it. We can't pretend that it doesn't exist or that because it's online, it's not real. We cannot retreat behind walls. Women, we know that violence happens there too, right? We know that being out in the public sphere offers us some affordance of safety at times. And I think it also means, in this day, being in the public sphere does mean being on the internet, that this is how we get to fully participate in civic life. So yeah, sure, we whisper the tips to our friends and our colleagues and students. I think we can work quietly and loudly to resist. We have to build alternate networks, right? We have to build alternate education technologies, but we have to do something and we cannot continue to be silent. Thank you. So I guess I'll field some questions or we can all just like <laughs> go get a drink because it's <laughs> such an uplifting talk I just gave you. <laughs> yeah. Am I the only one who doesn't know what shirt day is? Oh, good, good. No, good, because it's, so last week, um, the European Space Agency landed a rocket on a comet. Awesome, amazing, humans are incredible, right? Um, but one of the rocket scientists on a day that sort of, he knew all the cameras from all over the world would be turned on him and he would have a chance to speak, showed up to work wearing a shirt that had half-naked women wearing PVC armor in sexually suggestive clothing. And when folks were watching the live stream, um, a, a, a colleague of mine um, commented, ooh, like, inappropriate shirt. And since then has actually received death threats. Um, so this notion that, uh, that, so I think Shirtgate, much like Gamergate, is sort of this idea that sort of um, feminists are trying to like destroy everyone's fun by making people not ha play, um, not play sexist video games and not wear naked lady shirts to work. So that's Shirtgate in a nutshell. The internet's wonderful. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, OK, so what advice would you give to women on the internet, especially in our age range, 18 to 24, that have seen friends get harassed and stuff on different social media sites? Like, what should we do since like, we're normal users? We're not internet famous. Yeah. We're not going to take us seriously. I know. That's so awful. I mean, it, and I think that that's, I mean, I think that that's our, like, that's our experience in harassment offline as well, right? Like very, it's, it's still very 
difficult to be taken seriously when you report any sort of harassment. Um, I think that one of the things that you can do, and this is actually something that um, that everyone should do, d should do, is sort of um, beef up your security practices, right? Like, what would you do if, if for whatever reason, um, the angry hordes from 4chan decided to come at you tomorrow? Like, what do you have in place to make sure that your world is secure? Do you use two-factor authentication, for example, like on your Gmail? Set that up. Set up two-factor authentication on Twitter. Set up two-factor authentication on all the apps that have two-factor authentication, right? Don't use the same password for everything, right? Um, have, have a group of folks or, you know, and if, like, um, have a group of folks that you can turn to when, when something happens and create a support network for each other. Um, I think that one of the things, uh, one of the things that friends and I do that when a friend has a blog post, for example, that goes um, viral, is to offer to moderate the comments for them. Just say, like, you don't, like, don't even look. Like, don't look. Ah, we'll, we will deal with that for you. I think that there has to be better sort of self-care. But for the first thing is, like, have your security ducks in a row so that people actually can, like, come at you, but they're not going to get access to your bank account, to your email, and sort of dismantle your digital life. That's such a weak-ass response. I mean, I wish that there was something better, I could say, like a bat signal that we put up, and, but yeah. Sorry. You had, you had your hand up. I was, yeah. I was pretty horrified by the John Gameshi news, um, but one of the things that I found kind of heartening about it is that I, I would have never found out what not for Twitter. Um, you know, I don't follow that guy. I don't know who he is really. But the fact that people um, responded and, and responded, I think, very carefully, especially people like Dan Savage, mm -hmm. who tends to sometimes go a little nuts. And, and he was like, let's, let's hold off, let's wait. Yeah. Um, I think that, that really helps people feel, I think, that, that they're heard and that you know, the internet gets criticized a lot, and rightfully so, for being kind of a wild west. But at the same time, it helps, I think, many of us not feel alone. And so there's, um, I, I don't know that you can ever really control that, right? It's always going to be a wild beast. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think that, I mean, I, th I you know, there's the part of me that really, I mean, obviously, like, I work on, I work on the internet. I live on the internet. I spend most of my day on the internet. I spend most of my day on Twitter, and then until I, like, want to, like, hurl my computer out the, out the window and um, set it on fire and dance, dance on its ashes. Um, but uh, I think that, I mean, I think that, that, I think that in some ways, this idea of the freedom um, and the sort of anarchic play and self-expression that the internet has afforded us um, is a positive thing, but I think that, that it's not accessible to everyone in the same sort of way. And I, I would hope that we could sort of, sort of not, romanticize, not romanticize that until we sort of recognize the way in which the places that are the wildest west are the places that I think are still somewhat dangerous to be particularly for, for women, for marginalized, for marginalized groups. I mean, I remember bringing up 4chan with my son, and he was like, Mom, don't go there. Like, don't, don't ever go to 4chan, which was kind of him to look out for me that way. But yeah, no, I would never, I would never, never go to 4chan. I don't feel like I could go to Reddit. Like, it's the front page of the Internet, and it's not a site I feel like I'm, I feel comfortable being on, and that sucks. Like, that sucks that the front page of the internet isn't welcoming, you know? So you already answered the question about what can we do from an individual point of view. From a more institutional or curricular point of view, what are some things that we can do to help students not only um, understand, you know, what's safe for them, but to make really good decisions? But, you know, you said silence is clearly an answer. So what can we do from a more institutional um, I mean, I think that part of it comes back to sort of these questions around security, 
right? These questions around what are the trade-offs that we're making when we sign up for certain sites? Or what happens to our personal data? What sort of, what sort of looks like, um, what sort of looks like freedom, which is actually sort of um, laying open your personal lives to be data mined. Um, I think that so there. I think that there are discussions about that. I think that there are um, thinking about um, you know. I think that having a having a domain of one's own is a really important consideration, but I think that we sort of need to talk more about what that means and how that plays out for everyone as well, right? Sort of having your own space on the internet. I mean, it's the thing I advocate for it's th all the time, but it, do it looks differently for different people. And um, how do we talk about that? I mean, how do we talk about that the way we talk about um, ideology and sociology and gender in our other classes as well. How do we reflect that um, when we think about our digital our digital selves as well? I mean, I think that you know, I think that education is a is an important component to this. To look at, to look closely at the tools that we use and recognize you know that they're not neutral. Right? Go when Google says they want to organize the world's information, I mean, bullshit. They want to like sell ads against our searches. Like they aren't they aren't in some sort of like civic civic gesture to sort of you know be the new library. I mean this is you know we need to sort of ask more questions about the things that we're being sold technologically as being whiz bang solutions when they're not. Um, I have, uh, I think that Wikipedia, Wikipedia is great in theory, in practice it's, it's um, not so, again, not so fun necessarily to sort of be, um, to, to, to be, to be part of that community, which is again, minority, very, very small number of editors on Wikipedia are, are women. Um, and we see the sorts of, that there, I mean, I've heard all sorts of wonderful stats about this, that there are like, m entries for like minutia around the minutia around the minutia of like Iron Man's different costumes, right? That there are like pages and pages and pages about the different looks of the Pez dispenser. And when a woman decided to create a page about Kate Middleton's wedding dress, it was scheduled for deletion right away because it wasn't a worthy topic. I'm like, I got to tell you, like, I think the future Queen of England's wedding dress, it's at least as important as what Iron Man wears. Um, so I think that, you know, I mean, I think that that's the thing. We see this, so we see what the culture, what the culture values. We see what the culture wants. Um, and again, the, the sort of, the way in which Wikipedia editors, bless their hearts, are very quick to come in and correct things that don't fit their, you know, fit the norms of uh, nor their norms of their culture, our culture. It's supposed to be our culture, like their culture. Yeah. You had a, you had your hand up. Well, sometimes I wonder: Do you think that a disproportionate number of new people find their way onto the internet, or do you think that there's all these new people walking around and their newness only comes out in secret on their computer? Right. I mean, because I have to admit one reason why I'm in academia is because I like to be surrounded by. Oh. oh, okay. I was like, are you an undergraduate? Are you an undergraduate? You're not a graduate student, right? Oh, you're a professor? Oh my gosh. You look. Really? What field are you in? Oh, maybe they are nice there. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I'm being flippant. I think that, I mean, I, I think so. I think that, I think that humans are sort of not so nice to one another. I mean, look around, right? Like, you know, that things are sort of fucked up. Like, I mean, humans did that. We did that to each other intentionally. I think online, I think that online certain things, certain kinds of, um, assholery gets like projected in different ways but yeah no I I mean I I think that yeah sorry that's a really like Jim is like people are great Audrey shut the hell up no go ahead yeah
Right. And of course, nor, neither of schools, because of course, schools' response, I mean, I think K through 12 response is like ban it. Right. right. So instead of having an interesting conversation about perhaps what um, Wikipedia is like or an interesting conversation about YouTube comments, like I think a, a, a conversation about YouTube, com YouTube comments with 13-year-olds would be a very important conversation to have. But instead, schools say, well, eh, we'll just make sure they can't get to YouTube while they're at school. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we make it easy to, to be that way, too. Is it possible That's what I sometimes, I mean, that's what I imagine. It's like 15, like, really badly behaved people who are out there, like, lots of accounts. That's what I like to think, too. Right, yeah, yeah, but I like, one of the things that, that's always, like, made me feel good about the internet was, like, this notion that, that when we see, when we witness bad things on the internet, what it's really doing is exposing to us the bad stuff that's actually right. happening in real life. Like, like there's some, like the harassment that women experience behind closed doors is very hard to respond to and do anything about because it's happening behind closed doors. But ironically, what's happening on Twitter, you can look at the mentions of people and you can witness this harassment. Yeah. Um, but I'm now starting to think that maybe I should feel comfortable. <laughs> You know, like right. you're a worthwhile role model for my kid. Right. You know, um, so I think it's. I mean, it's nice to some know, degree. People, people fight back in a mature, thoughtful way. I think is really right. encouraging. Like if if the internet is providing us this kind of like window into what is sadly not a very great thing. That's not a bad thing necessarily. Like it's a painful thing to witness. It is. Yeah. Something to work through and figure out. Well, how do we make something? Like how do we make this better? Right. Um, Right. You know, in some ways can feel even more terrifying yeah. Because now you know, yeah. exposed in a completely and it's in a, in a new way. Or right? I mean, I think that that's that's part of it too. Is I think that you know the these technologies are changing very quickly and culture changes sort of slowly. Um, and so I think that we're we are sort of experiencing this like this sort of disconnect where we feel as though these things are changing and we haven't yet we certainly haven't developed. Um, a legal framework, although I'm not sure I would suggest a legal framework is the answer. But we haven't developed policy, we haven't developed sort of laws, we haven't even developed sort of autoresponder email things that like let us address these things. They're happening really, really quickly. Yeah. In the back, yeah. So I think I think that one of the important things that the internet does give us is that is that moment of being a, like no one knows you're a dog, right? That there's something really powerful about not having to reveal who you are online, because um, it's not just nasty trolls on YouTube that that are. Although I guess YouTube has got rid of their comments, but it's not just nasty trolls that that respond anonymously. I mean, whistleblowers, for example, right? People who cannot attach their names to what they say because for, for, for really significant political reasons. So being anonymous online, I think, is, is important. What the, and the flip side of that, and this is what you know, amazes me as someone who gets um, very lengthy um, fan letters from people who make all sorts of threats under their real name. They have no, no problem signing an email from their work address telling me, you know, so I think that this idea that sort of attaching your real name to it gets rid of harassment um, isn't quite true. I think that some people for reasons of privilege or reasons of <laughs> kind of idiocy, um, you can decide, 
are perfectly happy to sort of still be jerks under their real name because they don't think that there are going to be any consequences. Did you want to follow up? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um. Yeah. Any of those consequences that the real life real world may face. So, you know, it may seem that people are, are just like more, you know, cruel and mean on the internet, but really it just means that they just need to say what they say. Yeah. I think that's true. I mean, I think that we hold both of these truths in our mind at, at the same time. One is that there's not a real body on the other side of the screen. Like, we pretend as though that we're actually just talking to user accounts. Like, that that's actually not a real person with real feelings um, on, the, on the other side of the computer screen. But then at the same time, I think that some people are very aware that there is a real person. And I think that there is um, sort of a concerted effort to hurt you, to fantasize about um, to fantasize about sort of about what happens to your physical body. And I think that we have both of those in our heads at the same time, that, that, that people aren't real online, and yet we know it's really real. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of one of the things, particularly in in um, in education technology, and I think it's almost in any sort of workplace or um, regularly scheduled meeting environment, including perhaps the classroom, is that there are some voices who talk and talk, and I mean, it sort of gets at the mansplaining thing, but it's not always about mansplaining. It's just the, the, the person who takes up a lot of space verbally, time-wise, who always has something to say about something. And we don't do a lot of listening. Tho 